James Kern Lindsay is an academic and analyst with internationally recognized expertise on Southeast Europe, the Balkans, Turkey, Greece, and Cyprus. He has extensive experience working across government, private sector, higher education, and think tanks. He's also a regular commentator for international media, including the BBC, CNN, and Reuters, and is co-editor of the Cyprus Review. I don't know if that's current. I will check with you in a minute. From 2000, 2005, he covered Greek and Cypriot politics for the uh, for the Economist Intelligence Unit and runs an extremely successful YouTube channel uh, on international relations and policy. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. Please like and subscribe to see more of the incredible speakers that we feature and definitely comment on the videos. It helps them to perform in YouTube. It helps people to discover new content all the time from the channel. And also check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. It's never been more important than it is now to help Ukraine stay resilient against Russian resistance, especially uh, in places like Kharkiv. James, welcome to the channel. Thank you very much. Lovely to join you. And hopefully the intro wasn't too garbled. Hopefully that was mostly correct. Yes, yes. No, just the um, Cyprus review. I stopped editing that. Yes, yeah, of course. Yes, obviously. Yeah. Apart, apart from that, but don't, well, don't worry. Nobody's <laughs> that's too much. The internet it. remembers everything, but remembers it badly. I think that's the uh, <laughs> thing there. Well um, so what we're going to talk about quite a lot of stuff, but of course, the core of it is Russia, Ukraine. I mean, is it fair to say that Russia's uh, you know, destruction, essentially, of the post-war order uh, and its stated intent to create a new uh, order based on, well, that's not quite clear what it's based on, um, is this one of the defining events, uh, certainly of the 21st century? Yes, look, I, I mean, I, I think this is a, absolutely right, the, the, the point you made. And, and this is what I think really worries me. And I, I think in many ways sort of worries me about the reporting of the war in Ukraine is that, um, you know, as somebody who's worked on conflict for a long, very long time, uh, you know, I and, and taught conflict uh, for a long time as well, you know, I, I'm very keen to point out to people that, you know, this isn't an ordinary war. Uh, this, I think, really bears all the hallmarks of, of what we would call a systemic war. Uh, you know, when we think of, you know, you know, and I've been meaning to do something on this for a while. I mean, you know, obviously, sort of types of st systemic wars that we would think of would be the first and the second world war. And so people would say, oh, is this a third world war? Well, no, but I think it bears all the hallmarks of a conflict that could fundamentally rewrite uh, the very basis in which on which international relations takes takes place in rather the same way that the First World War and the Second World War and previous Napoleonic War, for example, and, and, and the Thirty Years War going back to the Treaty of Westphalia. You know, so this could potentially be the fifth systemic war. And again, I know it sounds really sort of exaggerated and over the top. But I think the fundamental questions that we're dealing with in Ukraine about territorial integrity, about independence of states, uh, about ideas of self-determination and giving that the right for other countries to intervene are extremely worrying. And if Russia were to win this war, then I really do think that this, this potentially has uh, the chance to, to, to rewrite um, so many of the values and the, the approaches to international relations that we've seen since 1945. So, you know, again, maybe sounds a, a bit exaggerated to, to somebody on first sort of, uh, you know, when they first hear it. But again, as somebody who's looked at conflict, study conflict for, for 30 years now, um, you know, this this really does bear all those hallmarks. And so it's a very worrying time. And of course, propaganda would have us believe, and in fact, many who are locked into a kind of left-right paradigm, which we try to avoid on the channel, uh, will say, okay, well, it's NATO, it's great power conflict, you have realist a school of thought, etc. And they try to impose these kind of constructs and processes over it. Um, is it possible that there are far sort of deeper mechanisms going on here? I mean, one of those would be, and very much systemic, the collapse of the last great European empire and one of the great land empires of history. Could we be seeing the sort of slow motion car crash of, of this huge tectonic shift and change? Um, 
And there's other things we could talk about as well, which is the impact of technology, uh, the declining power of elites. If we go back to the First World War, as you say, you know, one of the interesting uh, hypotheses about the First World War is is essentially when you have the the impact of a technological revolution, but without the political culture to be able to handle that, combined with the weakening and decline of a traditional elite who feels that this kind of aggression is a way to in, entrench their power, but it ends up destroying uh, that that elite entirely, who'll be looking at a far deeper set of processes going on. Well, I think that that really is the worry in many ways that um, what we're seeing now uh, is laying the foundation for other countries to follow suit. And I think, you know, we, we, we're already seeing uh, some of those elements that are coming forward. So the, the fact that Russia feels that it's perfectly acceptable uh, to say, well, um, we're going to march in and seize the territory of another country, uh, you know, and remembering territorial integrity of states is a fundamental principle of, of, of the modern international order. I mean, this was the great transformation from the 19th century to after the Second World War and the creation of the United Nations was that you just don't do that. And now you have Russia going in and countries by and large resisted uh, taking those sort of steps. I mean, if you think about it, there were very, very few examples prior to what we've seen in Ukraine of countries actually seizing uh, and annexing territory of another. I mean, two sort of probably stand out. I mean, uh, you know, one one would be probably Israel's um, annexation of the Golan Heights in 1981, which was roundly condemned by the international community. There's UN resolutions. And, and of course, one of the interesting things under the Trump administration is that that was then recognized by the United States. Uh, but the one that we would all immediately turn to is um, Saddam Hussein's invasion and annexation of Kuwait in 1990, which obviously prompted a very fierce international re um, you know, uh, response. It led to the first Gulf War in 1991, uh, you know, to step back against it. But you know, you can count very, very few examples of states that actually went and did that. And so Russia going in and doing that in Ukraine, but now we start to see that there's more other examples. So, for example, you know, we had uh, in late 2023 uh, a crisis erupting in South America as Venezuela laid claim to Guyana and suddenly announced, you know, started to build up its troops on the border and started to announce and produce maps showing that, you know, two thirds of Guyana now belong to Venezuela. I mean, fortunately, it didn't come to a conflict at that moment, and you know, hopefully, it won't in future. But it was very interesting that you suddenly had a country that felt that it could do that, and one can only assume, you know, that is the result of feeling empowered uh, by watching exactly what Russia is doing. And uh, you know, we we are, I think, you know, there is a certain nervousness that there are other countries which could be waiting in the wings uh, to say, well, look, you know, if Russia gets away with it. Uh, then we will do the same. And of course, I think the other thing that's really important to, to bear in mind about all of this is that this is a war that is not only a war of aggression, military, standard military aggression. It's, a, it's an example where a country has been able to march in, seize territory and do it with the threat of nuclear weapons. You know, there is a, an explicit nuclear blackmail element in this, which is Russia saying to NATO, don't you think of stepping in too far uh, to help the Ukrainians? And, and the West has obviously responded in that way. So if Russia eventually succeeds in this war, then you can see that that's sending out two messages. It's sending out messages to potential aggression uh, aggressors that if we have nuclear weapons, uh, then that puts us in a stronger position. And of course, when countries get it into their mind, that's the case, then, you know, the countries they could march against start to think, well, the only way we're going to be able to defend ourselves, and we're seeing a lot of this narrative in in in, in Ukraine, is we need nuclear weapons. And, you know, the discussions should Ukraine, it should never have given up its nuclear weapons is an argument you're seeing. Now, I happen to believe uh, that we would all be better off in this world without nuclear weapons, but you can see now why there's an argument, and this has been, you know, there's quite a long body of thought in this that says actually, you know, counterintuitively, maybe the world will be a safer place if everyone gets nuclear weapons. And I think a lot of countries will probably shift from the former category of saying, look, this is a very dangerous thing. We don't want nuclear proliferation to starting to think, you know what, maybe we need to start considering this for our own safety. 
So again, you know, when I say that I think that this war is, is systemic, that it has the potential to fundamentally change international relations in the 21st century, I think, you know, these are the factors that we have to bear in mind. And these are the sort of land-based implications. Are there another set of implications which don't get nearly as much attention? And this is the sort of maritime implications, because it's not just the international order about preserving sovereign borders. Since the Second World War, we've had an international order that has preserved maritime trade, fee trade, and certain rules, certain compliance, insurance, standards, and the rest. And of course, you know, not everything uh, applies to all the laws all the time, and piracy never quite went away. But generally speaking, there is an established maritime order. It seems that Russia is not only challenging the land-based order, it is seeking to overturn uh, this uh, international trade order as well and the frameworks that support it. And in that, they have a number of proxies in authoritarian states. And you have quite a number of democratic states as well and quasi autocracies who are quite happy to enter into transactional arrangements with, I would say, the new um, international disorder as opposed to order. Mm -hmm. No, it, 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 exactly, and I think this has been one of the really interesting elements of the of, of the conflict as well. That um, you know, whereas the West would have hoped that a lot of countries that would have come on board, and you know, I mean, to a certain extent, you know, if you look back at the UN Re General Assembly resolution, of course, you could never get a Security Council resolution condemning Russia. But you know, the, the next alternative was to go to the General Assembly. You know, there have been these resolutions which have roundly condemned Russia, and you know. I, I'm sort of thinking, I think that we got to one where it was, what, 141 or 143 of the 193 members of the UN supporting it. So a fairly substantial number. But nevertheless, you know, we have seen this problem uh, that there are a number of countries around the world which have, in you know, steadfastly rejected calls to impose embargoes on, on Russia and, in fact, have actually gone very much the other way and have increased their trade, taking advantage of it, you know, uh, so, I mean, obviously, the relationship between Russia and China is a very complex one and a very interesting one, uh, you know, but looking at India, for example, uh, that, um, you know, has actually increased its purchase of Russian oil, uh, you know, off, off the back of this. And I think there's been a lot of disappointment, uh, for example, the India, um, but, you know, India has, has a very interesting and long-standing relationship with Russia anyway, um, you know, but it did look at one point like Modi was going to be moving uh, more towards a potentially Western direction. He seemed to have rode back on that. Um, but you have other countries. I mean, you know, for example, I, I've been very um, concerned about Turkey's position in, in, in all of this. Now, I know that there's a body of thought that says that Turkey sees itself as playing a, a role of an intermediate, uh, intermediary in, in, in relations with Russia and talking about, you know, the grain deals, um, getting grain out of Ukraine and everything. But you know, part of me also, for, you know, is, is very concerned at the way that Ankara has responded to this and not signed up to the sort of sanctions that all its NATO partners have signed up to. And, and one could see the argument, I suppose, that it says that it's, it's playing this mediating role, this, this you know, um, but we need NATO unity. I mean, you know, it, it really is important on all of this. And when you've got one country that breaks off, and of course now we're also discussing the problem of Viktor Orban and Hungary uh, and, and its behaviour, and also, you know, there, there's growing concern about Slovakia as well. Uh, you know, so we are starting to see some countries which are starting to peel away from it. You know, bringing those back in and showing that unity first and foremost is then important to being able to go out, I think, to other countries. But I think there is also a much greater discussion to be had about how and why, um, you know, given the fundamental importance of, of, of the significance of this war in Ukraine and what it could mean for international relations, the West hasn't been better at being able to go to the global south and explaining to them the importance of, you know, ensuring that Russia doesn't win this war. Because in, in many ways, by philosophical outlook, these countries should be very nervous about any changes to the idea of um, altering borders through armed force. 
And, you know, it, it, it's actually been quite a testament. I mean, if you consider it, that you've got all these borders in Africa, which are colonial borders, which have held up remarkably well uh, since decolonization, you know, in, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s and 70s, that there have been remarkably few border wars in Africa, that even though you could say these are lines or maps drawn by European powers, whether it's Britain, it was France, Portugal, Germany, Netherlands, whichever, um, these lines have tended to be respected. So you would imagine that these are countries which would say, absolutely, we don't want to be redefining that. But on the other hand, you know, it, it and it's in many ways, it's been one of the most interesting elements, I think, of modern international relations. And it's really come out at the moment, the degree to which Russia, which is itself a colonial entity, there's no getting around it, has actually managed via the Soviet Union uh, to create this sort of latent impression. It's the anti-colonial force and tied in with the way that the West has behaved. I think we have to acknowledge this. You know, we're dealing with a very, very complex, interesting and also confusing picture uh, in international relations. But to wheel it back to that original point, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, what we're seeing with these other countries trading with Russia is is, is also raising some very important points uh, about the nature of the global system. And, you know, are we sort of letting uh, economic interests always trump uh, what might be, you know, everyone's better, wiser global interests, if you like? Let's turn back to Africa in a minute, because I think there's a, a number of sort of disturbing questions that sort of come out of, of that and some recent discussions that I've been having. But let's stay on this uh, idea for the moment, because a lot of people say, oh, it's because of Iraq, it's because of this. But I think um, there are certainly people, uh, as you say, in the sort of broad global south as a concept uh, across the African continent and so on, who will fundamentally... Uh, be resistant to our calls to support Ukraine um, because of, as they see it, uh, past hypocrisies. Um, we're outraged at people like Orban and others who choose to have a transactional uh, relationship as opposed to a principled one, uh, especially when it comes to, to something like Ukraine war. I mean, if you're less charitable, you, you could go further, of course, and call them Putin's agents and so on. But let's say they're choosing a transactional relationship so over any kind of principle. Well, a lot of people in the global south will say, well, hang on a second, you know, you're all for principles in theory, but the West has flouted its own rules numerous times uh, in that period of post-World uh, World War II order. Yes, and this is something that I have long worried about, uh, you know, and I think that there are several particular incidents that stand out. So, for example, you, you know, we, we both, as people who do YouTube, I mean, you know, obviously we have our conversations in real life, but, you know, when we go on, we make these videos, we read all sorts of interesting comments, uh, you know, very often abusive comments, uh, you know, which make exactly this point, what about? And, you know, on the one hand, you know, we push back against the idea of what about, you know, let's focus on the subject that we have at hand. But we do also need to bear in mind that there were a number of steps that were taken. And, you know, I I felt very uncomfortable at the time. And I wouldn't like to say vindicated now, but certainly a sense that, you know, those of us who were saying it were right, that there was a moment of, uh, and probably quite a prolonged moment of, of hubris uh, that we saw in the West, uh, of believing that we could flout those rules. Now, I mean, the argument would be we were doing it for the right reasons. Uh, yes, but um, that was not how the rest of the world saw it. Uh, so Iraq is uh, the prime example um, that we sort of, you know, when the United States went in and Britain followed. Now, I mean, I, I always do take this point that, you know, very often you'll see people accuse NATO of being this imperialist. Look at what NATO did in Iraq. No, hold on. Now, a lot of people weren't, you know, and it's terrifying to think that, you know, a lot of viewers were far too young, if not born, um, you know, when, when you know, the Iraq invasion took place 20, 21 years ago. Uh, but, you know, there is a lot of people who forget that, you know, this was actually strongly opposed uh, in parts of, of the West, that the French and Germans uh, sort of were very anti it, that remembering, uh, you know, in, in France, it was that sort of moment of sort of saying that, um, you know, Eastern Europe missed a good opportunity to shut up. 
um, you know, which was very offensive at the time. But, you know, that was that was the sort of the point that the French government of the day was making. Um, but you have a lot of people who would say, you know, who are you to talk now about sovereignty, independence? Uh, you know, when the United States invaded Iraq, um, Kosovo is another one that comes up a lot. And, you know, I, I, I wrote a book about Kosovo's independence. I was very critical of the way that that independence was achieved. Now, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in Kosovo. I know Kosovo well. I've been a visiting scholar in Pristina. It's not, it was not based on any sort of antipathy towards the Kosovo Albanians, but it was certainly based on a deep concern about the fact that we had certain principles in place and notwithstanding and, and not wishing for one moment to try and uh, negate or deny the horrific actions of the Milosevic regime in, in, in Kosovo. But the reality is that we should not have gifted Kosovo independence in the way that we did. Now, that's not to say that Kosovo shouldn't have been independent. You know, I think there's a very good argument for, for, for Kosovo's independence, especially, you know, framed in the overall breakup of Yugoslavia. It was ridiculous to expect that Kosovo would remain part of Serbia when Montenegro, which actually had a lot more culturally, linguistically, religiously, you name it, links with Serbia, went and became an independent state and Kosovo didn't. But the reality was that Kosovo fell into a different category. And for our own reasons in the West, we said, well, it has to become independence now. It was essentially to get us out of a, a, a problem. But it's used against us the whole time. And it, it created, I think, a, a, a very worrying problem that we see time and time again uh, that people will say, well, you know, Kosovo, you know, and, and Russia uses the Kosovo precedent. Interestingly, Russia flatly refuses to recognize Kosovo independence, but it was very quick on drawing on that precedent and saying, well, you know what, we're going to use this to make our justification for what we're going to do in, in South Ossetia, in Abkhazia, uh, in, in Donbass, in Crimea. You know, what the West can do with Kosovo, if it can take part of a sovereign state's piece of territory and give it independence, we're going to do exactly the same. And I think, you know, unfortunately, but I can also understand why, um, you know, the West, I, I think, made a lot of mistakes at, at, at the wrong moment, um, especially when its power was already starting to decline uh, and set precedents that then, as I say, a lot of the world looked to and thought, right, OK, if they can do it, so can we. And I think, you know, Trying to look for logic and consistency in what Russia says is probably going down an extraordinarily deep rabbit hole. Looking at their actions, however, is another thing. And flouting borders, using uh, separatists, little green men, using sort of various false flags. There are a bunch of techniques that are used over and over and over again by Russia to uh, not just insert um, or to, to, to fire up sort of insurgency and trouble, but it always aligns with some political interest. It always aligns with the idea of weakening your foes. And it always, these days, in post-Soviet Russia, aligns with someone making money as well. So if we apply that back to the African continent and the stable border situation you talked about, this is deeply worrying because we see Russia positioning itself as an anti-colonial power. We see Wagner extremely active, especially in the sub-Saharan region of the Sahel. We see insurgency after insurgency, after which, miraculously, Wagner seems to be um, at the right hand of the dictators, uh, you know, the power rulers that are uh, that are placed in these countries. And then you see an extraordinary rapacious. Um, activities around extraction industries like gold mining, um, mm. possibly even uranium, uranium et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at the moment, that is in the context of established borders and creating dictatorial models. Well, if they follow the full Russian pattern, we could well see uh, border wars being used uh, as political props, you know, if they go down the full route of the Russian playbook. And there's no reason to think they won't if they're already, uh, you know, their power is partly dependent on utilising the Russian paybook and Russian resources.
So this exactly is the worry that I, I think a lot of observers will have. I mean, uh, so far, it doesn't seem that what we're seeing is spilling over into interstate war, thankfully. But, you know, it's certainly causing a lot of problems internally. And, you know, we can see uh, this sort of proxy activity. I mean, one very good example, a, a case that, you know, has gone completely unnoticed by the international community is Sudan. Uh, so there was a flurry of interest early uh, in 2023 when, when the country sort of began to collapse. But essentially, you've got these two military warlords who are fighting it out between themselves. But what's been really interesting is that there is actually a proxy element. Funnily enough, it seems that there's a proxy Russian and Ukrainian element uh, that's crept into this. So one of the factions is supported by Russia and the other one, you know, there's been reports of Ukrainian commandos involved. Um, you know, I, I don't imagine that it's a particularly large number because I can't see a lot of Ukrainians sort of going off and fighting in, in, in Sudan when, you know, there's obviously a, a greater problem at home. But nevertheless, it has been very interesting to see this. And you're right about the Wagner group and things. So I think at the moment, you know, we we haven't seen uh, a big shift in how African countries are talking about borders. But again, I, I come back to the, the, the point that I think that this is something that could potentially be on the horizon and would be extremely worrying if African countries start to say, right, OK, our borders are up for challenge and might makes right. Uh, then we are dealing with a whole different world of chaos uh, that would start to kick in. Um, you know, when when you have 70 odd countries then saying, right, OK, we're, we're, we're going to start arming to the teeth and sort of making claims on one another's territory. Uh, so, again, something very much to, to, to watch out for. I think at the moment, though, I mean, the concern very much is in the I don't mean this in a terrible way, but the, the, the more traditional civil type of conflict although of course you know these days the idea of a completely civil war is 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 actually rather you know rather unusual i mean more and more wars do actually have an outside element so for example congo you know when we talk about that in africa but by and large as i say it's it's very much been broadly that civil war type of dynamic but i think you know if we start to see these sort of interstate wars over territory then you know that that potentially becomes hugely hugely problematic for the international community, not just because this is going to be wars that are going to affect Africa, which is, you know, a long way away. But as we know, uh, conflict becomes a major driver of migration. Uh, you know, the more and more people have to flee from conflict zones, the more and more people are going to then start turning up in, in Europe. And we know all the problems that go with that. And also, you know, what's been fascinating, you know, when we get onto the subject of hybrid warfare is how migration has actually been weaponized. Um, you know, for example, by Russia, by Belarus, uh, as, as part of their strategies in order to weaken uh, European countries, because they know this is such a sensitive issue. But more countries we're going to see, the more wars that we're going to see uh, taking place, you know, these, the, the greater the threat in many ways to, to Western cohesion coming from all these spin-off factors. And dare I say, it, Russia's been using that card with Syria for a long time, whether we chose to recognize uh, it as a weapon of war or or not. Let's turn back to something else you said there, which is that um, deterrence or a failure of deterrence um, is, is, is what may define this era. And you mentioned Venezuela there feeling an impunity to, uh, to do something which would have been unthinkable a few decades earlier, unthinkable in a different era where the major powers were willing to exert um, considerable military force in order to, you know, to reestablish the rules. Um, we see now something which, and, and some people won't like it being labeled this, and usually they focus on the MAGA, and especially if you're a, a Democrat, you'll say, okay, it's all about Congress, it's all about MAGA, they're the real problem. But actually we also see in the failure to enforce any kind of red lines, um, I call it almost like an equilibrium appeasement, where you get uh, really a policy led by the National Security Advisor Biden, uh, not Biden's uh, advisor, Jake Sullivan. Um, but his view is likely shared by a great many people within the administration. And that has cast doubt on the idea that actually anything's enforceable, that any red lines at the end of the day are, are will, will actually be upheld. That perhaps even extends to Article 5. Um, so rather than making it a sort of partisan thing, do you think we're we're entering an era here where 
the consensus around enforcing rules and the willingness to enforce rules is essentially breaking down again in a more systemic way. Well, you know, this again touches on um, events and issues that took place 20, 25 years ago. So, you know, we remember that, you know, the end of the Cold War saw a sudden sense of there was going to be, you know, and this is a term that is extremely controversial, a new world order, uh, that, you know, the superpower confrontation was gone, uh, that you now had the United States as a hyperpower, and there was a sense that uh, a lot of issues could be tackled, a lot of wars, conflicts that sort of emerged also out of the end of the Cold War, uh, you know, we could go in and it was the era of humanitarian intervention. It was about this sort of muscular, you know, diplomacy to deal with with conflicts, with situations, which obviously took a dent uh, in, in Somalia with the with the US intervention there. Um, but nevertheless, it sort of continued through and then obviously reached its sort of apogee, if you like, uh, with the with the US invasion of Iraq. Uh, well, you know, we had we had Afghanistan and then Iraq. But of course, that's fallen out of favor. So there was a whole discussion about responsibility to protect, that we need to do this, we need to take this muscular enforcement action uh, to deal with human rights abuses in countries. And after Iraq, that started to be rolled back, uh, that there was a realization these are huge commitments uh, that need to be made, uh, that uh, I think, you know, we perhaps forget just how badly Iraq was handled. Uh, you know, so militarily, it was a very swift victory, but there was terrible, terrible planning uh, for the aftermath. And we also saw Afghanistan where billions, trillions potentially were spent uh, on trying to stabilize it uh, after, you know, the, the Taliban were ousted. And then what did we see? We saw the United States pulling out in complete disarray and I think what this means is that a lot of Western countries, um, and understandably, have become incredibly reticent about wanting to get militarily involved in conflicts. Um, you know, and as I say, in one sense, one can understand. I mean, you know, these are a long way away that people would say, where is the real justification? Where, why should we be doing this? But I think there is also that sort of sense that maybe it's gone too far. Um, that there are still cases where, in fact, actually more can and should be done uh, to stabilise the situation. And that might require boots on the ground to do it. But the problem you run into is that, you know, if you're a multilateralist, if you believe in, in sort of the primacy of international law, as I like to believe that I do, uh, that the deep divisions that we see today mean that you cannot get the UN Security Council authorization that ideally you'd want for these sorts of situations. So if you see, it becomes a, a very troubling circular pattern that we've in, created of, you know, when there was that opportunity to act in a more sort of um, multilateralist way, we didn't. Uh, that started to break down. Now, if we want to, it would be almost impossible because what we see is that Russia is often very often taking advantage of this instability uh, for its own ends to to extend its influence for whatever reason that might be. Uh, so it's actually become, you know, which means that then if we do intervene, it looks more unilateralist again. It's Western intervention, which then feeds that sort of narrative that Russia is very effectively playing on of saying, well, look, you see, they're still invading countries. They're still violating sovereignty. So I, I guess this is a very long answer to say we're, we're in a horrible mess. And I think I'm like many others. I'm not entirely sure how we get out of it, but I know that we have to some way. And in many ways, the start of that will have to be, you know, and wheeling back to, to Russia's defeat in Ukraine. We're back to Ukraine, of course. And as a non sort of specialist, um, this may be a far too simplistic answer, but it seems to me that where we go into other countries with a so-called idea of democracy building, that is almost doomed to fail because you need an extraordinary uh, self-investment, maybe over generations and a certain culture um, to want to preserve or you need the foundations of democratic change um to to be able otherwise you're 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 sinking money into a, into a, an open hole um 
which is to an extent what we saw in Afghanistan and Iraq. You know, you cannot build a democracy from scratch where that culture doesn't, uh, you know, hasn't hasn't had generations to sort of foster, and it, it takes a huge amount of resources. Whereas in Ukraine, what we've got here is not democracy building, but democracy defending. And it's an interesting equation. If you have to foot the bill for everything, it's unrealistic. But if you've got Ukrainians who are willing to do the heavy lifting, and an extraordinary fact is that 20% uh, of the funding and effort behind Ukraine's war effort since 2014 has been based on volunteer input, not state input. It's a very different dynamic, isn't it, where you actually have a democratic culture that is willing to do most of the work um, and where in this instance of giving them the tools for the job um, is far less risky, far less expensive. And so far it's proved to be far more effective because when they've had advanced weapon systems, they have done extraordinary things with them, but it's the consistency of that supply and it's, you know, upping the scale to more complex munitions, which there seems to be a real problem with especially in berlin and washington well i i mean you know and you know it's straying onto controversial territory but uh, you, you know ultimately you're right i mean i i think i think that you know ukraine becomes an important uh a very important front uh more generally for upholding international norms values uh, I think, is, again, the, the West, just as I think we also have to acknowledge, you know, the West part in 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 sort of getting us to where we are at the moment, uh, but still recognizing that the fundamental foe that we're facing is is now this sort of Putinism, if you like, uh, you know, you know, I think. We, we have seen in the past problems with Ukraine. I would like to think that obviously we are now in a, a phase where things are definitely going in the right direction. And I think it's absolutely vital that, you know, we, 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 we defend Ukraine. It had a lot more problems that I think sometimes we really truly acknowledge uh, before. And there have been issues that I think, you know, could have been handled better. And, you know, this is where I think, you know, it. There is the opportunity at some stage, historians are going to go look back and think, you know, what could have been done differently? And I, I think, you know, very often, you know, we still have these debates over what really started the First World War, which is sort of quite interesting. How did we end up in this? Um, you know, and and I think that there were there were underlying issues. And I've somebody who's worked as somebody who's worked on international conflict, but also ethnic conflict for a long time. You know, I think that there were mistakes made. But fundamentally, we are now in a very, very different situation of, uh, as I say, that what might have been able to be handled more in terms of an ethnic conflict uh, has now graduated to something far, far more um, serious. And that's not to say that Russia wasn't getting involved. But again, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, a little earlier, I mean, you know, the idea of a holy civil war is actually remarkably rare these days. Uh, what we saw, you know, and we've seen the United States get involved in all sorts of conflicts elsewhere. We've seen Russia doing it. But I think, as I say, what's really taken this to an entirely new level is the fact of seeing Russian troops marching in and then, you know, Putin signing a decree, this is now part of Ukraine, um, which has, uh, you know, as I say, takes it to a very, very different level. We'll have to pick up on that again, because it's my reading or my understanding of mafia's sort of uh, the mafia networks, the way it works, the SBU and the, 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 the various layers of how it seeks to sort of um, inflict its system and its set of rules on a country. Um is at multiple multiple levels so i mean it's my belief that without russian interference on multiple levels um very unlikely it would have reached a, a hot conflict it would have been a strong civil confrontation of some sort but that that's part of the process of of, of nation building um and you know we we, we have extraordinary uh strongly expressed uh struggles in a variety of european countries including you know spain Britain as well has its own examples, yes, uh, but no, yeah, it absolutely. will be debated endlessly. Uh, no, of, of course, and of course, and I, you know, I, I do think, you know, there will there will be these sort of moments that sort of look back and sort of think, right, okay, things could have been done differently, but we are where we are, as they say, and uh, you know, as this, 
I do firmly believe. And look, you know, and, and I, I point this out to, you know, I'm not by nature a hawk. I'm not the sort of one who sort of believes that, yeah, we need to be sending in military forces. I've spent my career working on conflict. I've been involved in a number of peace processes. Uh, you know, I firmly believe in negotiations, but I think, you know, this is one of those cases when, you know, and I hear this a lot, people saying, oh, well, you know, we need to stop the fighting and get into negotiations. What? What? Tell me what you think we're negotiating here. Are we negotiating the principle of territorial integrity? Are we saying that a country can march into another country backed by the threat of nuclear force? And then we stop that conflict and we allow, the, you know, we then say, and for the sake of peace, you will negotiate away part of your territory. That is just as dangerous as allowing the conflict uh, to, to continue in, in, in many ways. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it sows the seeds of a far, far deeper disintegration of the international order, which I think will, you know, it will lead to more, ultimately more destruction um, in, in the future. That's a very powerful place to end. And just, just to add one last sort of small um, question on to that, it's framed often in terms of uh, land. Also, often, especially where you have sort of, I would say, sort of leftist comments, um, it would be framed in terms of resources, a very sort of capitalist interpretation. But at the end of the day, these aren't just territories. Many of the people who live in those territories are essentially hostages of the Russians and there are many tens and tens of thousands of children and others who are in what can can basically be described as sort of brainwashing psychological torture camps. Um, so again, it's it's not really purely about sort of borders, territories. There's something far more malign kind of going on here. And if we if we choose to freeze it, we're choosing, I would say, to to ignore some of these extremely toxic and unpleasant things that are also part of Russia's actions. Yes, and I, I mean, you you, you you actually end up in a very different um, range of discussions because, of course, you know, we already have the ICC, uh, International Criminal Court, uh, inve investigating Russia uh, for the abduction of children, which, you know, and remembering, of course, that actually that constitutes uh, a crime of genocide under the Genocide Convention, uh, you know, which, so this is not, you know, I mean, at a human level, we recognise its seriousness, but even from an international law, slightly distant, you know, this is a huge element, but then you start entering to all sorts of other things. So for example, you know, if you're in occupation of territory and you change the population by introducing settlers and things like that, you are also breaking international law. Uh, you know, so there's a whole range of elements that sort of come out of this. And, you know, uh, but I, I think what I would say is, I, I think, you know, the danger that we run into is that, you know, we're having this debate, and I will be very honest in saying that I know that there will be people watching this who think that this is just a couple of Westerners who are talking about this, and it's all hypocritical, and that, you know, what about all the things that the West has done, that they're overplaying it and everything. And again, you know, I can see where that thinking is coming from, but also as somebody who, as I say, sees myself as essentially somebody who believes in multilateral uh, international law. And I've been very critical of policies of, of Britain, of the United States. I, you know, really do emphasize that what we're seeing uh, in Ukraine is a step beyond anything that we've seen, uh, for example, the United States do, uh, you know, in, in, in Iraq. There is still a sovereign, independent Iraq that still has its territory within its borders that it, it, it had prior to 2003. There is still a sovereign independent Afghanistan, which still has its territory as it was prior to the emergence of the Taliban. That's not the same with with Ukraine as things go, that Russia has gone in and claimed. So it's 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 committed the three. It's violated, as I say, sovereignty, it violated independence and it's violated territorial integrity. And, you know, and I, I know that people say, but what about? Well, yes, as much as you might not have liked what happened in Iraq or Libya, these are still sovereign states within their borders. What we've seen in Ukraine is, is 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 something far, far more serious. And it comes with a whole raft of other issues that, you know, even disassociating yourself and saying, look, you know, I'm not going to buy into that Western narrative. All right, fine, you don't have to, but just go off and read up about 
uh, you know, where international law stands. And you start to see the wholesale violations of that uh, in Ukraine. And this is reason why I think, you know, even beyond the West and beyond our sorts of conversations, you know, this is something that a lot of other countries and a lot of other people in other countries should be paying far, far more attention to. And this is a subject for a future video. Just queue up the future video. I'm going to do some more about Africa. These violations you talk about almost inevitably um, result in uh, strongmen being inserted into power, dictatorships of one sort or another, um, because this behavior certainly benefits them. And what do they do? They suppress, torture, kill their own populations. So if you think, you know, this is a Western problem, this is going to come back to bite people badly uh, in terms of erosion of civil rights, democracy, uh, the ability to to generate functioning, productive economies, freedom of expression. It, it's all connected. And I think that that cues up a future discussion there. But for this one, James, it's been a huge privilege speaking to you. Um, I strongly recommend people check out your, your, your videos. They add incredible depth to uh, international affairs. And of course, this, this, I would say, strongly moral argument around borders and sovereignty cut through all of them. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really great to join you.